welcome to this Roll for Crit review, and today we're finally reviewing what we gave our number one pick for Game of the Year in 2017, Seventh Continent. Yeah, so spoilers, we are going to like this game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of good things to say about it, and this is also an interesting one because it's another game that kind of is very spoiler-laden. It is hard to really show you too much about it without giving things away. So we're going to try our best to skirt around that stuff as, with our explanation section of the yes. review. Like Gloomhaven, this really is a game where you open the box and you're pretty much diving into a huge adventure. Which, unlike Gloomhaven, which is taking place in sort of a, um, what would you, not, not sci-fi. A fantasy. Fantasy, thank you. <laughs> yeah, world. This is more, reminds me more of like a pulp action adventure. Right, right. Definitely kind of that 30s, 40s serial style thing, slash Mist, slash uh, Robinson Crusoe a little bit. All kinds of adventure stories mixed in. To give you a brief rundown of how it works, uh, everyone has their own character. You can play this with up to four players or just by yourself, mm -hmm. which works very well for this game. And we kind of have a mid-game to late-game setup right here. Uh, it's not giving too much away. There's some items you might not see until later on, but don't worry about that too much. And you're going to start on a terrain tile, and depending on which curse that you choose, your goal is to try to rid yourself of this mysterious curse. And how you do that, you don't know. You just have to play and try to follow this clue and what you find in the environment to figure that out. Right, and all the curses have different clues. Like this one actually shows a little map. It's actually the one they suggest you start off with. That's right. And <laughs> there will actually be, each tile will tell you where to go and a different number of event to put there. As you explore the island, you may encounter more like snow or desert or maybe some other things. And every terrain card fits together perfectly. It's not like, oh, just random map tiles. As you explore, you really uncover a world that looks like it was built to be designed together because it was. It was intentionally for you to find that way. That, that way. Yeah, someday when I've done everything in here, which probably won't be a long, long time, I sort of want to just lay out all the tiles and see the island in its full glory. It can get insane because, for instance, the first curse uh, you start off and it's sort of a smaller section of map. And then later on, when you start delving into it, you can end up with cards covering like this whole space to the point where I'm, it's a little overwhelming. Like I don't even know well, where to start. They actually have a mechanic in the book that if you get too big for your table space or something, yeah. <laughs> that you actually reset sort of the board and put them back in. And the way you, everything works is these cards we've said, and to put back in is this box. Usually we don't have the box in front of us, but it's important because <laughs> everything is on numbered cards which they have in dividers, so like that's for the first hundred, second hundred, and you find the number card for whatever you need, and I'm trying not to look at the back of the cards, <laughs> for all this crazy stuff. And that could tell you like, okay, because you found this event, look at number 302, or look at number 44. And what I've noticed is, because this game is can be very harsh. Just like those old point clicker text adventures, you can die and have yeah. to start over. Or like a choose your own adventure as well. And some of the event cards, you may thought like, oh, I remember this event involving steam or leaf bugs for a small hint of what you may encounter. <laughs> but it's a different outcome. because mm -hmm. you, they, So they put the same event, but with a different result. So you can't assume you know the puzzle. Yeah, so even replaying it, you're definitely going to run into some of those things again. But you never quite know if it's going to turn out the same way. And even if you have a certain item, maybe, that might trigger with something that you didn't have last time, that can really lead you to a whole new place, potentially. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on. Essentially, the way everything works in the game, every action that you take is done in the same way, which is you need to draw a certain number of cards uh, indicated by a cost. And then on those cards, you're going to find different amounts of stars, or maybe half a star. And you need to get a certain number of those stars visible from the cards you drew in order for it to be considered a success. And uh, there are different things you can do with items or cards from your hand to affect those actions to make your odds better. And you can draw as many cards as you want to try and get more stars, but if you run out that deck, you're going you're gonna to start drawing from the discard pile. And if you do that and you draw a curse card, that's how you lose. That's a game over. But you can refill your deck before you have to go to the discard by like eating food. So now you have this surviving aspect when you might also spot a hunting ground 
or a fishing spot, and you're like, oh, thank God, I need to get all as much meat as I can from here. Yeah, so it's a very uh, back and forth thing of deciding when should I push to really make sure I do this action well versus my deck is running low. I don't know if I'm going to be able to hunt anytime soon. I really have to be careful. And sometimes there's, you know, there's things on the map that you might really want to look at, but it might not be in your best interest to go do it because you might just be a waste of your time. Yeah, and you have cards in hand which you could maybe use for stars or their events, or you can play them as items. And then it becomes this fun thing of how to use it because, for example, this raft gives you automatically two stars plus a star with a seven, which is pretty much like a bonus luck thing uh, depending on what cards are revealed. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a either a swimming event or a sleeping event, and you can also combine your items, as you can see here, because you only have a certain amount of space for them. Well, not only space, but uses. Right. See, currently, that's what these dice here are for. And every time you use it, it goes down one. And if you go below, hit zero, it breaks. So then you're like, okay, I'm going to play this card here to give it more uses and stuff. Yeah, um, you've also got different types of cards that can go in your hand. Uh, these are bonus cards, which are special abilities. Maybe even this one over here. This one is a side quest. So there are side quests in this game. And there are wounds as well, and they're really interesting and unique. It's not just hurts you. There's like, for example, this one's bloody, and you actually get rid of it by going in the water. <laughs> Yeah, so it's very thematic. Like everything makes sense as a mechanic and in terms of the theme, uh, which I, I really appreciate. You can even get experience points as you go, and later you'll be able to actually purchase advanced cards that can go in your deck or your hand. So there's a lot in there, and there's so much that we aren't even going to discuss because. A lot of it isn't even in the rule book, for example. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of mechanics that are just explained as you play. Exploration is definitely the theme of this game. And if, if you like the idea of exploring and trying to find hidden objects and just discovering new regions, this game gives you that feeling in an amazing way. Yeah, this comes with a few curses, but each one takes a long time. And now that brings up the thing, what if you don't have the table space or time to play it in one sitting? This box has it for you. There is actually a save mechanic. <laughs> so you can take your cards, put it back in the box, and come back to it later. Yeah. It's a video game done just in cardboard, perfectly. Yeah. It really, it really, really is. Or if you're someone like me who has cats that jump on the table, <laughs> you need to put this away and not worry about losing anything. Uh, that is a real, such a great thing to have. And a big thing, we both played this single player. I did one multiplayer mm -hmm. with it, and it was very interesting because it had to deal with the resources management. But playing single player, just it really felt so comfortable and nice because... It gives you a lot. It doesn't feel like single player is just, okay, it's a one person version. Like, you get a lot more resources. The exploring feels a lot more different. Like, it just is those point good games that we love. Yeah, this is, I mean, I love solo games, but by far, this is probably the best, I, I, in my opinion, as far as the solo experience goes. You don't lose anything in the translation. From, you know, there's something probably cool about having those discussions with each other. What should we do? Where should we go? Also, you can check that path. I can check this path. But it's balanced very well. You never feel like, oh, if only I had a friend to go look over there or anything no, like that. No, in fact, when, when I played the multiplayer version, I did straight to four <laughs> in our, my first time playing this because uh, I'm not smart. And what happens also is the resources are much thinner. So you have to almost be careful because everyone's managing their own. Right, right. But it becomes interesting, too, because as you explore the island, some train's harder to get to. But if it's explored or someone's there, you can actually help people out. So it also becomes a game of hopscotch, almost, which yeah. is also really cool. <laughs> but in the single player, you're allowed to get more charges in pretty much on your equipment. So you really become more of this lone survivor. You're the, you're the renaissance man, <laughs> as opposed to being like, oh, you have the snowshoes, and I found a snowy section, so you check this place out. You know, something like that uh, could be really fun. And you'll find things that, as far as I know, don't involve the curse you're in, or you don't know. You'll see some weird carvings on a wall. You'll be like, what is this for? Yeah, that's something I found very interesting, because when I first played the game, I assumed, I didn't really realize how it worked, that each curse was kind of its own scenario, which they are in a way, but really it's 
one giant game, and no matter which curse you choose to solve, you could run into all of them throughout your, your mission, your journey. Yeah, they actually suggest playing with multiple curses at a time, which sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> so it is possible that, I mean, you can get lost if you're not careful, and uh, depending on, you know, you might find this to be a fun discovery or really frustrating, you might just end up in a totally random wrong area of the island and have no idea what's going I on. I do think that's actually one of the reasons why this made our number one is because both of us are the kind of guys who love just going straight to the lore of a world or something and that's literally what this is. You're ex the only way to win this game is really to explore and think lore-wise and get into the idea of like, all right, this statue said something about they walked one went north and one went east or something and you're like, okay, what does that mean? And you have to like, or the following sun, so you have to actually think yeah. like you're in the world. Or you'll find a, a thing that needs you to insert two objects in order to operate it. So you have to go find those and come back. Uh, it's, it's very, the puzzle solving feels really smart and satisfying. You always feel like you figured something out when you find that right card for the next number. And one of the nice things is when you do die, which can happen, because assuming you do the same curse, you'll know sort of the island lay and be like, okay, I remember the snow was that way and that didn't help, so maybe I should avoid that. Mm -hmm. But as I said, because of those events, which could look the same but have different outcomes, you're not 100% like, I already solved this and I just need to get to that point. So, and, or have different items come up. So that really adds that perfect amount of like randomness, but reward for knowledge. Yeah, that actually happened to me because the first time I played through, uh, I lost and then I restarted again. And I was kind of like, oh, I gotta play this again. This is gonna be a little boring at first. But like, I, because of the items I had, like this time I had things that made me better at swimming. So I used this to take a different path over this way and I ended up having a completely different adventure or I, I did something I remembered from last time and this time like a totally different thing happened. So it was really, really interesting that way. And you can change the difficulty level as well. If you're also people like us who uh, uh, sometimes you just wanna play and not worry about dying as much, you get like a, basically a second life which is really nice if you just want to explore and not feel too burdened by that pressure. I will say that's probably one of the biggest negatives some people may have with this game is it is a commitment and time of laying out. And that's mm -hmm. why they had the save function. And for some people that might not be, that may be a bit too much or just a hassle, especially when you can just die when you're just so close to the end. Once again, like I was, I've been watching a video on the old like type, like look at rock kind of. <laughs> like that's what this game feels like. Here's our crits and misses for the seventh continent. Crits. There's a super immersive atmosphere. The theme and the mechanics all coalesce to really make you feel like you are on an epic journey. Because everything that you do in the game is based on the same action system, it feels tight and focused. You never are unsure about what you need to do and when you'll have a different result, but how you get about it is always the same, which I thought was really elegant. You didn't have to learn a bunch of weird new mechanics for each puzzle. It was more a matter of just trying to think logically. Every time you play, there are going to be exciting new cards and new events that show up. Even if you've already played it once before, you never know exactly what you're going to run into. Without sacrificing anything from the multiplayer mode, the solo mode is robust. It feels great if you're just a single player playing this game. There's an effective save and load system as well as difficulty tweaks that you can make to tailor how you play and when you want to play. Let's get on to these misses now, shall we? This game can have some unforgiving moments at times, which may actually lead to you dying, which can be sort of grueling experience of retracing your steps from the previous playthrough. As we've noticed with probably many games that have a really deep lore or big play time, the setup and teardown time can take some time. Yeah, it's funny enough, I noticed when you first start the game, it's actually very easy to get into. You just have one card and you build the map as you go. But when you need to move to a new area or save your game, putting those cards back number by number can take quite a long time. <laughs> I just put like on a podcast and just put them back in as I listen to it. In order to stay alive, you'll be shuffling your deck by adding cards all the way throughout the game. And we've noticed that this may lead to some damaged cards, or at least some on the edges. So we highly suggest 
you do pay a little more for the sleeves. Yeah, like a deck building game, you're going to be shuffling that main deck a lot. Uh, it could be a little tougher than normal because these are square-shaped cards. Maybe those sleeves aren't as readily available in your local gaming store, but something you should look into. Alas, they don't fit the standard magic sleeves I have lying around. <laughs> I'm going to reiterate what I said if you watched our Best of 2017 video, which is that Seventh Continent, more than any other game that I honestly, that I can even think of in general of all time possibly, but especially for a solo game, is one that when I was, I started a game and then I had to leave for the day and go away, I was constantly thinking about coming back to play it again. It's, there's something so exciting about it that personally, for me, playing by myself, I could just play this game for hours at a time like I would with a video game, whereas normally with a board game, uh, I might lose interest with the setup and reading the rule book. This one, everything is so seamless and fed to you in such a fun and engaging way. All I want to do is just keep playing and keep discovering what's going on in this world. Yeah, and in fact, it's the exact same feeling for me, especially even when finishing that first curse for the first time, because I found all this other stuff, I'm like, so what is this for? <laughs> and yeah. it just makes you want to come back for more. And the fact that for a long game to have a save function is just such a, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. And another awesome thing is, uh, really great for the two of us, both playing solo, to come together and be like, to discuss what we found and how it's different. And, and oh, did you find this place? Oh yeah, what did you do there? You did this? And you can have completely different experiences, but it's so enjoyable to, you know, being careful about spoilers, talk to each other about what you found. That, that's, that's half the fun, honestly. Yeah, it really brought me back in the end, because I keep relating to video games, because this does, I think, hit how, because we got into video games before board games, mm -hmm. but it gets that scratch of almost like when you were a little kid before the internet, so you weren't like, yeah, I saw the video for it. <laughs> like we were in that, oh, I don't know the strategy, there's no way to know, so what did you find? Yeah, yeah. It gets that excitement again. That, that, that hidden element, that mystery, it's there. Of mist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all there. Uh, so the seventh continent, I mean, my only question is, Aren't there already seven? Google it. There's, <laughs> there, you can find out what that means if you don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's excellent. Highly recommend it if you can get in on one of the late pledges or if they do a new Kickstarter. Or I, I think you, know, you may be able to find this in stores at some point, but it is a bigger game that's a smaller print, smaller company. So you just have to be on the lookout. Uh, please let us know in the comments if you've played The Seventh Continent and what your favorite part of it was, curse that you liked, <laughs> character that you liked to play as, uh, anything like that. Re re really fun stuff. If you agree or disagree that it should be our favorite game of 2017, uh, that would be great to hear from, you know? I think so, don't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, until we see you again, my friends, out there in the open ocean and the mysterious jungles of the world, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Will, and I'm stuck on a raft. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a Roll for Crit review. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more board game content. Every little bit helps. Please, we gotta eat.